Hey everyone, I'm Manar Mohawash and welcome to another episode of Mint Press News' Behind the Headline. With Athens lit up in flames as cash-strapped Greek protesters flood the streets after the nation takes destructive austerity measures, bankers are yet again asking for billions of dollars in bailouts while the average citizen can barely put food on their table. Protesters accuse these same international creditors, or Troika, who make up the European Commission, European Central Bank, and the International Monetary Fund itself of destroying Greece's economy in the first place. And as creditors continue to rake in millions of dollars in salaries, Greece is set to impose more wage and pension cuts to citizens to meet the terms of the $315 billion bailout. Stealing from the poor to give to the rich has never been more obvious. But one Robin Hood in a nearby European nation hopes to hold these same creditors accountable as the UK heads into the same austerity direction that could eventually lead to major riots. George Galloway has stuck out his neck for years as member of parliament, but now he's running for mayor of London under the Respect Party. He says he's going to fight the crime at the belly of the beast itself. He's referring to bankers, of course, in London, who he says are sucking Londoners dry and walking free, while those who commit petty crimes face years in prison. Galloway is courageously taking on the most powerful elite, who have engaged in destructive neoliberalism, tightening austerity measures, and are driven by an imperialist war machine. Joining me from London, I talked to him about his platform and how he plans to hold these institutions accountable before England sees a similar fate as Greece. Take a look. Thank you so much, George, for joining me today. It's an honor to have you. Uh, we've been following your work for many years now, and uh, I appreciate you coming on. You know, before we get started, I'd like you to talk a little bit about, um, you know, fair election coverage in the UK. Uh, in the United States, we have a two-party duopoly, making it extremely difficult for alternative voices and independent voices to be heard. And I understand it's very similar in the UK. How will you fight tooth and nail to get fair media coverage and debate inclusions this election season, considering you don't receive any corporate funding for your campaign? Well, you have two parties, but only one prevailing orthodoxy. We have several parties, but overwhelmingly the same prevailing orthodoxy. And uh, the media reflects that. They can argue about a cent or two on or off the income tax rate. They can argue a little bit about the parameters of the inch that they think is the space that we have to maneuver in. But anyone who thinks outside that space, outside that box, outside what Dr. Johnson called the dictatorship of the prevailing orthodoxy, is demonized and marginalized, traduced, described as bad, if not mad, or maybe both. And uh, I've had to suffer all of that for more than four decades. And by the grace of God, I have prospered. I have been elected six times to the British Parliament, always against the odds and often toppling very big and powerful figures in the process. So that tells you that you can fool some of the people some of the time. You can probably fool enough of the people enough of the time, but you can't fool all of the people all of the time. And uh, we're looking always for ways to get up on our soapbox, whether it's literally a soapbox in the street or on programs like this, which will proliferate across the internet or on the alternative television channels in which I'm quite prominent these days to get our message across. We don't have any corporate funding. In fact, we have virtually no funding of any kind at all yet. We're crowdfunding and asking people to donate to fuel this election campaign for Mayor of London, which is far and away the biggest election 
uh, I've ever fought with an electorate of 8 million people and a requirement really to get 1 million votes if one is to prevail. And you have a very big task ahead of you. I mean, you've taken a quite a bold stance. I mean, you want to arrest bankers in London, which is a major financial hub to some of the most notorious banks, uh, like the Bank of England and many private central banks, so much of the Federal Reserve here in the US. So tell me what they are doing to the UK that is destroying the economy, and how does this compare to what's happening in Greece? Well, they're doing exactly to us what the same people did to you and they brought your country to its knees also. And actually, there's, a, there's quite a two-way street between the two, New York and London. Uh, the people who run banks in London are often American. The people in big positions in Wall Street are often British. And uh, the Anglo-American model of finance capitalism has come to dominate the world to the detriment, not only of the world, but of the Anglos and the Americans. And so London, as you say, is a, a hotbed of vice, a hotbed of criminality. It's an organized crime racket uh, of the kind that uh, Al Capone used to run in Chicago. Uh, and we intend that some of the people involved should end their days like him behind bars, however we can get them there. And so my challenge for the uh, mayoral campaign is to clean up the excesses of the city, which has become a kind of square mile of vice and criminality to the detriment of everyone else in London and everyone else in the country. And of course, Greece, uh, as you mentioned it, is merely the latest victim of that grim financial orthodoxy, which is absolutely contradictory, of course, because the same people who tell us how orthodox they are and how uh, debts simply must be paid are the same people who, through quantitative easing, have created out of thin air, out of nothing, hundreds of billions of dollars to give to banks not to give to the ordinary people who might have used it to kickstart the economy, but to give it to the banks who brought the economy to its knees in the first place. And the Greek people's revolt, which we saw recently in the referendum, is the perfect answer. It's the democratic answer from the home of democracy, where democracy was invented. They told the bankers, enough is enough. We can't pay, we won't pay, because we've already paid more than enough. And, you know, speaking of uh, the oligarchy, what are central banks without war? I understand you're working on a documentary called uh, The Killing of Tony Blair with the line, some people make a living, others make a killing. Uh, what do you hope to help expose with this new film and accomplish? I mean, will Tony Blair see The Hague? Well, the film will be out shortly. And it doesn't involve me, I should quickly add, killing Tony Blair, though it would be a pretty popular movie uh, if it did. Uh, it deals with the killings of Tony Blair, the killing of the Labour Party as we knew it, the killing of a million people in Iraq, uh, the deaths of whom continue to this hour, and thirdly, the financial killing that he's been making out of the previous two killings, undreamt of avarice in the form uh, of a single man and his grasping wife. So uh, it's going to be a, a pretty hot movie. I hope it's widely seen in the United States. It will be out soon. We have three goals, or had three goals, the first of, of which has already been accomplished. We wanted him sacked as the so-called peace envoy to the Middle East which, as I pointed out at the time, was the most grotesque appointment since Caligula appointed his horse as a proconsul of Rome, a man dripping in blood in the Middle East, being made the peace envoy for the Middle East. And as everyone knows, there's been nothing but war 
and disaster in the Middle East ever since he went there, although they've been very profitable years for him. So we've already achieved that. He has been sacked. And our campaign, Sack Tony Blair, which the film mounted, uh, is a contributory factor to that. But the other two goals have yet to be achieved. The second goal is to make him so toxic that no respectable state will ever hire him again, will ever solicit this man again for, uh, for his dubious favours. And the third is to put him on trial at The Hague, at the International Criminal Court for crimes against humanity and war crimes. And, uh, you know, speaking of, speaking of war, it seems that you know, this, this question actually comes from one of our readers, just, just so that I can mention. Um, one of the main countries uh, fomenting turmoil across the Middle East, of course, apart from the UK and the US, uh, which resulted in the Arab Spring, is uh, Saudi Arabia. And now it's waging a very bloody war on Yemen. Is this latest war a part of the same broader strategy that Saudi Arabia used to affect regime change across the Middle East using the Arab Spring? Uh, to suit themselves. What are your thoughts on that? Well, in a way, I'd be relieved if I thought they had a broader, a broader strategy. It's, uh, it's very important for your readers to know that we are not led by James Bonds. Uh, they're more like Austin Powers than James Bond. They are blundering idiots, as stupid as they are knavish. And what's happening in the Middle East right now is a result of several absolutely contradictory strategies in play at the same time. If we take Iraq and Syria, for example, the uh, powers say that they are intending to crush the infestation known as ISIS, particularly in Iraq. For that, they need the performance to be upped by the government in Baghdad, which is a largely Shiite government and which has the support of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Part of that strategy involves uh, talking themselves away from or down from the probability, which it looked like a couple of years ago, of war with Iran. That's why in Geneva, we hope, there's a deal done between the United States and Iran. At the same time, in Syria, the United States and Britain and other powers are pouring in money and weapons to the most extreme uh, organizations, including Al-Qaeda, which caused the United States such pain on 9-11 of 2001. Even though they know that Al-Qaeda are the beneficiaries of it, except where ISIS simply take the money and the weapons of Al-Qaeda and the weaker organizations who are in receipt of it. And in Yemen, it's quite clear that Saudi Arabia is fighting a proxy war against the very Islamic Republic of Iran that the United States is trying to make peace with in the nuclear talks and hopes to benefit from the cooperation from in the struggle against ISIS in Iraq. So there you can see across just three countries an absolutely contradictory set of strategies. So how it will all end, no one can say. But you are right to identify Saudi Arabia, which is the unfreest country on the earth, where women are not even allowed to drive cars, where they are beaten if they step out on the street without a male relative accompanying them, where people have their heads chopped off in huge numbers, record numbers, in public, on television, every Friday afternoon, uh, after mock show kangaroo court trials, where no one has any freedom or any liberty of any kind. And yet this same prison state torture state is not only responsible for most of the hijackers, for example, on 9-11, but is responsible 
for the spread of the Takfiri fanatic ideology of Al-Qaeda and ISIS all over the world. And yet, these people are our best friends. You don't have to believe me. Listen to what American presidents and British prime ministers and the British royal family openly state that Saudi Arabia is our best friend in the Muslim world. Well, how can you be best friends with people like that? And if you are, how can you expect anyone to take you seriously when you say you're in favor of freedom and liberty and democracy elsewhere? What's the difference between Saudi Arabia and Syria, for example? It can't be that we're against Syria because of one family rule, because Saudi Arabia is one family rule. It can't be because Syria has a dictatorship, because Saudi Arabia has the perfectly evolved dictatorship. can't be about human rights. There are fewer human rights in Saudi Arabia than there are in Syria. And I could go on, believe me. No, and that, that, was, that was very interesting. I mean, the biggest irony is when uh, the late King Abdullah died and, you know, our world leaders came together to say that he was a defender of human rights and fought staunchly against terrorism. George, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, I really appreciate it. Best of luck in your campaign. And I hope to see you again, okay? Thanks very much. Thank you.